Hey, I got to begin this week's message with a resounding go blue. We've been on quite a ride this fall and winter in Ann Arbor with our football team. And now the whole country knows we're the victors, the leaders, and the best. Our reputation has been cemented into history. But that got me thinking about that whole issue of reputation. Er earlier this fall, one of my friends was visiting, and his high school daughter is really into Taylor Swift. And apparently at the tour stop in his hometown, he and his daughter couldn't afford tickets, but they just went and hung out all day outside the stadium. And he and I were talking about this phenomenon of Swifties and that Taylor Swift is just known and renowned for creating and promoting a kind of acceptance and friendship among her fans that's remarkable. So, of course, then I wanted to talk about this with one of my adult daughters, who is a huge Taylor Swift fan. And then she began to tell me about how Taylor's also known for making huge and generous financial contributions to food banks in the towns all along her tour stops and for funding entire GoFundMe campaigns of random fans who are in medical financial trouble and for donating massive amounts of cash to various natural disaster and relief programs. So aside from her music, that's quite a reputation, no pun intended. Listen, to learn more about Taylor Swift, I had my daughter make a Spotify list to introduce me. And, and here's a little bit of our text thread. As I was getting ready for this message today, I, I text her, I said, uh, ha ha, just realized there's probably a Taylor Swift song about reputation. And she texts me back and you can see, it's in all caps, don't miss that, dad. Uh, she has a whole album called Reputation. Of course, my response is, well, I, I, I guess there's that. Clearly, I'm still trying to get up to speed on Taylor Swift's music. But the question for us today isn't about Michigan. It's not about Taylor Swift. It's about us. What is our reputation? What are we, as followers of Jesus, known for? It's MLK weekend, and Dr. King was known for his passionate pursuit of racial and social justice. And he remarked that Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. are the most segregated hour in America. And that quote has really stuck with me over the years because I still think it's true. So we're going to take some time today in this series, Life to the Full, to think about what it means to be known for the things that God cares about to have our reputation wrapped up in God's own heart, a heart that moves across the boundaries of race and ethnicity and social standing and nationality because we want to be known. We want to be known as a people, as a church, where our neighbors would say, boy, they really care about this city. Actually, whether they agree with our faith or not, they would think they're not just here for themselves, but they genuinely care for the poor and the marginalized and the, and the abused and, and the overlooked. Jesus referred to those people as the least and the last. And, and actually, they were part of his church from the beginning and part of his vision for the church right up to the present. So today, in the series Life to the Full, we're thinking about God's full heart for justice. Because life to the full isn't about just us. God's reputation from the beginning to the end of the Bible is that he cares about the people on the downside of the life, the people who can't get a fair deal, an equal opportunity, people who are trampled by the system, people who get either passively ignored or actively oppressed, people who don't fit in and people who don't have their act together. And, and honestly, that's a challenge for us. When, when you're the leaders and the best or the first and the foremost, it's really easy to look past the least and the last especially when we think we've got our act together and we're doing it right. And honestly, church people, we're really good at thinking that. We go to church and we sing and we volunteer and we give money and, and we think we're fulfilling our end of the bargain. We can even start thinking that we're building a good reputation with God or, or, or the pastor or even other people around us. But God sees the gap between our hearts and his own. One of his spokespersons in the Bible helps us see that. Amos was a prophet sent to speak to people who thought they were doing church right. The prophets were kind of pesky men and women asking dangerous questions and proposing even more dangerous answers, giving up their entire reputation in order to take up and represent the great reputation of God, the very things that he wants to be known for. And so Amos is sent to a people who thought they were doing all the right things to please God and keep their reputation with him going. 
They were tithing. They were celebrating holy days like our version of Christmas and Easter. They were good church-going people. But God's word through Amos is intense. It's over the top. It's direct and it's dangerous. It's not tame in any way. Listen to how the book of Amos begins. Right at the beginning it says, The Lord roars from Zion and thunders from Jerusalem. Uh, this sets the stage for God speaking like a lion, fighting uh, uh, or hunting or, or, or a storm exploding over his people. So we pick up the roar of that storm in, in Amos chapter 5. Uh, we're going to start in verse 21 if, if you want to follow along. Uh, God says, I hate, I despise your religious feasts. Your assemblies are a stench to me. God's saying literally your church stinks. He says, even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. A away with the noise of your songs. I won't listen to the music of your harps. Wow, I don't, I don't know if you caught how intense and strong that language is. God doesn't say, I hate or I despise very often and used together these words in biblical Hebrew mean that God is thoroughly, 100%, no doubt about it, absolutely disgusted with his own people for doing the very things that he himself set up to bring honor to himself. He's the one who told people to offer three different kinds of offerings in that sacrificial system. He told people they had to show up for church on the right days of the year at the right times. He told them they need to worship with song and instruments. All the laws God himself gave them about worship are encompassed in these verses, and they were doing all of those things. And he says, I won't listen to you. He says, your worship stinks. He says he won't accept their offerings. And that is stunning. For us, when we evaluate church and church services, we think, well, maybe they just aren't doing it right. Like if you really like hymns, uh, you think, well, maybe they just weren't singing deep enough songs. If you really like contemporary music, you, you might think, well, maybe God's rejecting them because they're not singing from the heart. Or, or maybe you're thinking, oh, their preaching was just too bad. Or, or maybe, maybe they were just being too loud or, or too churchy or too awkward or their services were too long or too short because because those are the categories for church that we usually use for evaluation. But the truth is, God's roaring, thundering rejection here is based on something altogether unexpected. God says through Amos to his people that instead of all that outward worship, he says, instead, I want to see a mighty flood of justice, justice rolling like a river, righteousness like a never-ending stream. Some translations say, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. You see, God is confronting them and us with a gap between what is said in worship and what is lived in the rest of life. I was thinking about that gap. I, I saw this great story on Twitter this week uh, about the reality of reputation and words and reality matching up. So, so this here is Tom, little Tom. He's seven years old. And, and one day, he, he told his classmates at school that his uncle was Superman. And, and he got made fun of, and, and no one believed him. Well, then little Tom's mom made a call, and she asked her brother-in-law, if he could take Tom to school. And, of course, Henry Cavill, Superman from the big screen, was delighted to take his nephew to school. Imagine little Tom's reputation in school after that. You'd probably believe almost anything he said to you. Now, of course, the opposite reality of reputation is powerful, too. Last spring, our pastors took a retreat, and and while we were there, we heard about a great barbecue place, famous for its smoked brisket. Big signs all over the place, lots of recommendations on Yelp and from people that we talked to. So we went for dinner, and honestly, it was a huge letdown. It just didn't taste good. It was nowhere near the reputation. You could taste the gap. 
The gap that God's pointing out in the book of Amos is just as obvious as a movie star or bad tasting food. And he uses two words to summarize that gap. He uses the words justice and righteousness. That first word justice, it's about action. Justice here is, is rooted in the idea of taking concrete action on behalf of someone to make things right. Not a theory or an abstraction, but something you actually do. And that, that, that always reminds me of this great quote from C.S. Lewis about forgiveness. He, he said, everyone thinks forgiveness is a lovely idea until he has something to forgive. Justice can be like that for us. It sounds good until we actually need to take steps to make things right between people. And, and that's where righteousness comes in. In this context, the biblical word righteousness here is getting after the idea of right relationships between people, regardless of social difference. It's a word that describes the absence of divisions due to social, racial, ethnic, economic, and political divisions. Boy, in our era of politics and conspiracy theories, it's hard to even imagine a lack of that kind of division. Imagine if our reputation as Christians were wrapped up in that kind of unity. Imagine how clearly that would point to God, how strongly it would show the victory that Jesus achieved on the cross that overcomes all those barriers between us and God and, and each other. Imagine how our church would be known if people knew that we cared about the deep challenges in our world like racism and immigration and mental health and, and housing and unemployment and underemployment and medical care and, and transportation and hunger and addiction and crime and violence. Imagine if we were known to be a place where regardless of your skin color or lifestyle or habits or hangups, you would receive mercy and you'd find fellow travelers on the journey of justice. Uh, imagine, just imagine if we were known for that. In Amos' time, the people of God were known for attending worship, but ignoring the poor and injustice. There was a massive gap between the character of the God they worshipped and the character of their own lives. They put comfort over conviction, wealth over worship, self over God, and God's plan is that real relationship with him transforms real relationships around us. Real relationship with God models the real character of God in the real world. And that's why this verse, Amos 24, let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never ending stream. That's why this verse features so prominently in the life and teaching of Dr. King, even in his famous I Have a Dream speech. Because racial strife and separation, economic disparity and brokenness, social stratification and infighting, these things are not simply fixed by singing a song or a hymn. If that's true, they, they would have been solved long ago. God's heart is that worship of him wouldn't just be an act in church, but an action in our life. And notice this picture in Amos is that justice and righteousness are supposed to be like a, a river flooding or a stream or a spring that, that never dries up. To his first listeners, people living in an arid, dry kind of desert world, rivers and springs aren't just a nice picture. They're vital for life. In contrast to water that dries up and disappears every season when it gets hot, God's heart of justice is to be an ever-present source of vitality for the world through his own people, the church. You see, God's plan, his hope, his desire, his dream is that he would be known throughout the whole world, in every place, with every person, as the God of justice, right relationships. And his plan is that his reputation would be renowned through the whole world, through his own people, through us. And so from the very beginning of the Bible to the very end, of every book of scripture, there's a call for advocacy on the behalf of the widow, and the orphan, the weak, the poor, the sick, the broken, the least, the last, the lost. In fact, the Bible says that doing justice and loving mercy is evidence that someone possesses an authentic relationship with God. So late pastor Tim Keller notes this in, in this great paper he has on justice. And he says, biblical justice is not, first of all, a set of bullet points or a set of rules and guidelines. It's rooted in the very character of God and it is the working out of that character which is 
never less than just. And so that stream or flow or flood of God's character, that river of justice and righteousness and compassion and mercy, it rolls down from the prophets right into the words and life of Jesus himself who embodies the very justice and righteousness of God. Jesus is the one who quoted Hosea and said, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Jesus is the one who quoted the prophet Micah and said, woe to you when you neglect the justice and the love of God. Jesus is the one who crossed racial and gender barriers to advance God's reputation for justice and equality. When he spoke to the woman at the well, Jesus is the one who touched the untouchable, talked to people who no one would listen to, befriended the friendless, stood up for the broken down, praised the poor, strengthened the weak, stooped down for the lowly. Jesus is the one who stepped into the very heart of God's justice on our behalf, justifying us before God, becoming a sacrifice so that his blood, as it flowed out, was a river of compassion so that we might experience and know the righteousness of God living in his very body, the great promise of Amos 5.24, let justice roll like a river, righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And Jesus is the one who founded a community that dangerously defied the injustice and righteous, unrighteousness of his time where Jew and Greek and slave and free and rich and poor and broken and whole men and women came together with all of their differences bridged by the cross. And what was their reputation? Well, we're here today because of them. We're here because courageous men and women gave up their addiction to comfort and took up the call to justice. So friends, justice, justice is about race and class. It's about the poor and the broken, the down and the out the people who don't have it all together and the people who do justice is a gospel issue, a Jesus issue, a God issue, a Bible issue. So let me just step a little bit into Amos's shoes and ask you two dangerous questions, questions that are going to threaten your reputation, but will lead you into God's reputation, how he wants you to be known in and through his work. Questions that will plunge you into the river of God's compassion and mercy. The first question is this, who in your life and world needs justice? Who's vulnerable? Who's in need? Who's facing insurmountable challenges or difficulties? This is a really different question than posting something on Facebook or Instagram about politics. This is a different question than developing a theory or a notion. This is the question of who is standing on the other side of a gap, a dry riverbed between you and the flood of God's compassion. It's a question of who's standing across the way from you, across the street, across the sidewalk, across the room, separated from you by the disparities of race and class and ethnicity and economy. This is a question of how God is calling you to stand in the gap, to cross the bridge of the cross beyond the gap, to fill that gap with an overflow of God's compassion and mercy. This is a question of our reputation as a church, a question of whether we are a people who truly worships the God who says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, so act justly, love mercy, walk humbly before me. So here's the second question, and, and it's actually more difficult than the first one about who in your life needs justice. Here's the second question. How will you inconvenience yourself for them? How will you inconvenience yourself for the people in your life who need justice? Because here's the thing, it's hard to say and it's harder to hear, but I'm gonna put it out there. Living for justice and compassion is not convenient. And we're addicted to convenience. And God wants us to get clean from that so that we can step into the messy realities of the kingdom advancing around us. It means giving up your time and energy and some of your money and your reputation and taking up the great things of God's heart and his reputation. It means listening and learning instead of demanding and declaring. It means stepping courageously into awkward situations. It means going out of your way to connect with a disconnected. And why would you do that? Friends, you do it because that's what Jesus did for us. The scripture says he looked into that gap between ourselves and God and he poured himself in, into it. 
He emptied himself. He made himself nothing, poured himself out like water in the desert so that we might be filled and overflowing with the springs of the Holy Spirit that well up even into eternity. See, the great reversal of the gospel of Jesus, of the heart of God, of his concern for his reputation is this. We discover that we live life to the full when we pour ourselves out for others, when we do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God. Let me pray for us. God, we see injustice all around us. We often feel stuck and unsure what to do. Fill us with your spirit, with your compassion, with your mercy, and show us courageous steps to take to step into that gap on behalf of the people around us so that your great name, your great cause, your great concern for justice can be known. In Jesus' name, amen.